I've never stood still, so I will do my best, but if I keep going like this, just don't blame me. Okay, uh, quickly, the section that you will skip if you ever watch this on YouTube, who or what is Y Green? Uh, we sell money, um, and that is what we do. We, we finance specifically clean energy improvements. So basically, you wanna put solar on your house, you can pay it back through your property taxes. That's really good. It's also the word energy spelled backwards. I did not know that until six months into my own job. Okay, let's talk about the humble microservice. Theoretically, this is great with absolutely zero drawbacks, as we all remember from hearing about microservices the first time. Amazing buzz phrases like loose coupling, independent management, and all the other stuff that we say that we love about microservices, and uh, an artist rendition in the bottom right-hand corner of what a microservice looks like. But at least for Y-Green, this carries a, a considerable cost, adding network hops, complex debugging scenarios, authorization authentication, version coordination between APIs, management burden for third-party dependencies, especially when security patches come in for other frameworks, and I'm assuming many others. So we end up having application architectures that look roughly like this. This was taken from an actual network request in one of our microservices. So my understanding of web-based services is essentially that uh, there's a lot of stuff that's the same. All of everything that you see in orange likely doesn't change from service to service. I need to turn this way so that I can see it with you. Basically, we all have hardware that runs things. We have languages, system libraries, operating systems, and runtimes. These are like servers and containers, Kubernetes, things like that. We have web frameworks, third-party extensions, things like uh, Ruby on Rails or uh, Java Spring or uh, other frameworks. And then uh, things that are more specific to our application or things that are specific to language implementations of web-based services. Uh, so performance things like uh, resilience, Hystrix comes to mind. Uh, and honestly, thank goodness for the amazing developers and companies contributing for as much as they have. They've made it basically super simple for all four of the bottom things to be the same for all of us and very standardized. But the problem is the top is the only thing that really ever changes. So in my mind, that should be the only thing we work on. Um, but unfortunately, we spend most of our time in the bottom for justifying why we need to rewrite everything because of some new thing that happened in the middle, like a new framework came out, a new version of a JavaScript framework that we now need desperately, we need to uh, put in. Okay, so what's the point? Um, well, I'm not leading a revolution in microservices. I'm just hoping that maybe one less thing becomes a problem for people. And uh, simply, can we use a network tool like Istio to handle one of those things? And here's an arrow to point to one of those things that I was talking about. Istio, by and large part, um, quick show of hands, who, when I say the word Istio, knows roughly what I'm talking about? OK, so that's most everybody. For those of you who don't, um, if uh, if uh, Kubernetes is, I'm sorry, if, um, yeah, if Kubernetes is the Kubernetes of running runtimes, then Istio is the Kubernetes of networking. Uh, essentially, it's just another thing that runs lots of things and orchestrates stuff. Um, <laughs> and I was not expecting the ovation at that point. Um, so the application-specific performance and security and resilience and all that good stuff is now wrapped up into a nice DSL and implemented in this sidecar pattern that's uh, very complicated at first, but then once you get used to it, you tell yourself that you really like it. Um, so right now, Istio handles request routing, retries, fault tolerance, authentication, and authorization, but it doesn't handle request caching. And I'll explain why that matters in just one second. Actually, this second, why would you care? Because you can delegate requests to the network. Things like long-lived JSON payloads or other things that matter that don't change a lot, uh, that impact the performance of your system, we end up writing things like Redis, um, Redis extensions or EV cache in the case of Netflix or memcached or things where we're implementing uh, all of our own stuff. So uh, right now there's work in progress with Envoy filters to basically allow uh, for response filters. That just basically means that we can have a layer of network caching that has a TTL. Think of it like a DNS record, but for JSON. Um, so here's a practical compelling use case. This, these are real wide green services that really do things, and, um, but they're very simple and they look clean, and, and, and that's the difference between that and what actually happens. Service areas basically contains this gigantic JSON payload about everything that we can do to service uh, a jurisdiction at wide green. We can uh, uh, basically charge people for uh, money that they borrowed from us. Um, and, uh, essentially, that has to be called by all of these services all the time, and it's a one megabyte payload that basically doesn't change because it moves at the speed of government, and that isn't going to change 
a lot. So uh, what if basically it ends up looking like this, where one time it actually does request it, and every time after that it takes microseconds for the response to happen? I think that that could improve the resiliency. And uh, if you are interested, please hop into the Istio and Envoy community. Thank you very much for your time. I ran out.